All right, guys, thank you, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, this is the second IoT Cleveland meetup, so thank you all for coming. Uh, see some faces that we saw last time, so it's good. Our, our group is growing. I don't know if you've been noticing, but it's, uh, it's growing, which is good. It means a lot of people are out there talking about IoT and um, this kind of whole field in general, which is, which is neat because it's about to blow up. Um, April 9th, just some dates, April 9th is International IoT Day. So if we want to, as a group, kind of talk about um, if there's something regionally we want to do to promote IoT, uh, after the meeting and the presentation today, that'd be kind of the time to have a group discussion. Uh, what a website's doing is it's actually aggregating a bunch of people, kind of like us, across the U.S. and across the world, and you're posting what you're going to do for IoT Day. So it's a um, good chance for us to let them know that Cleveland is kind of in, in this world and uh, partaking in the tech scene, which is important. So why are we here today? Well, we have a guest speaker, Ken Burns. Uh, very nice to join us. Um, he is, actually I first met him at Ingenuity Fest, which was kind of fun. Ingenuity Fest is a Cleveland tech festival uh, last a few months ago, many months ago, September. September. So um, we actually knew each other before we knew each other, but he's uh, the founder of Tiny Circuits. He'll be telling you more about that in a little bit here, and which is kind of fun. He had a very successful Kickstarter, which he'll also share with you, I'm sure. And he developed some really cool tiny gadgets, which are going to help propel Internet of Things into the future. Uh, this type of technology and miniaturizing things is exactly what this field needs. So without further ado, let's welcome Ken Burns. Well, thank you, Art, and uh, thanks for your invitation to be here tonight. Um, really happy to talk about Tiny Circuits, what we're doing, and also kind of geared this talk to just uh, open source in general, how it, how it can potentially apply to the Internet of Things. Um, so first off, it's it's Pi Day, so every everybody's a happy Pi Day, and we put a few digits in there so you can see uh, Pi. I'm sure some of you can go more digits than that, but uh, I used had to use Google. So today, this is I, I looked this, this up this morning. There's roughly about eight to ten billion devices on the internet. Um, traditionally, people think of PCs or smartphones as connected to the internet, and most of what's connected today are PCs or smartphones. There's about one to two billion PCs, those are your office PCs, home PCs that are connected to the internet. About another two billion are smartphones and different wireless type devices you might carry around yourself. All those are devices that you interact with directly. So a PC, you're on the internet, directly on a website or on a on your phone, you're making calls or texting, and maybe looking up websites on your phone as well. But outside of that, everything else is what's known as a thing, uh, which is a pretty vague term, idea. Um, it could be anything from a router to your automobile, it's got uh, cell phones built into it, or uh, OnStar and different things. So what exactly is a thing? These are a few different things um, that kind of came across. One is home security, and actually this is the home security system I have. This is connected, it's a GE system, it's connected by a cellular connection, and I can actually go on my phone, disarm that, see if any of the, the doors are open. So in a weird way, all those little sensors down there, they all wirelessly communicate back on a like 900 megahertz back to that device. And they're not truly IP enabled devices, but indirectly through that, that main system controller, I can see the status of any of those things that are out there. And again, this isn't a traditional type device like a computer, but it is connected to the internet. And I can get to my phone from my PC and control it that way. Also, a big thing you'll hear about in internet things is connected vehicles. Um, Lately, a number of cars have GPS is built in. You can actually browse the internet from your car if you want to do that. But from a thing perspective, your car could potentially monitor diagnostic information, report it back to the dealership, call back to GM potentially, um, uh, 
uh, to record certain statistics. They, I don't believe they do that today, but there is that potential for things like that. And outside of just passenger vehicles, if you look at trucking fleets, something that's very common today is uh, trucks tend to have GPS loggers, and so a shipping fleet can actually see where all their trucks are throughout the United States. They know how fast they're going, they know if there are any problems with a particular truck, and so they can really monitor real time what's going on throughout their entire fleet. And that's just going to become much more common as the years go on. So this kind of ties in with that. This is more of a, a logistics type tracking. Uh, it's very common nowadays that all those cargo containers will have uh, tracking capability built in. So not only GPS, they could potentially be remotely logged. So, I mean, if you look at container ship and all the different fleets that one might go through, that the tracking of that could be extremely critical from a customs or just a shipping standpoint. And then also within those as well, for logistics, you might have something critical in your container, whether it's, I mean, probably not in these shipping containers, but if you had a, a local fleet where you're doing refrigeration, where you have a local sensor that's monitoring the temperature within a refrigerated trailer that gets reported back. So, you know, if you're shipping food, if it spoils or something, you can you know, find out if a blower is down in your truck and get there before all the food spoils in your, in your truck. Uh, this is actually something I've been pretty heavily involved in at my previous job, which is industrial monitoring. These are all, these are actually pressure transmitters within a oil refinery. <coughs> actually, this is a refinery, but it's becoming very advantageous to put wireless sensors throughout industrial plants where typically running a wire would be extremely expensive. Now through the use of, you know, these are actually 802.15.4 radios, which is a low power radio. They're running the wireless heart protocol, which is kind of similar to Zigbee, um, but it's extremely high reliability. These get reported back to a central gateway within the facility, which is then connected to the internet. So similar to uh, that case of the security system, these aren't directly connected to the internet, but all the data is through another bridge type device. Uh, here's one. This cow has pretty earrings. And these are actually RFID tags. So again, not internet enabled devices, but uh, daily, what you'll see in livestock situations is they'll have a big RFID reader on a gate where the, the cattle go in and out. And so you know if a, cat, a cow is out in the field or in a certain part of the farm, and so again, you can track them. And longer term, you know, these are just passive RFID tags, but with the price of internet things, devices going down, potentially you could have GPS on a cow. You could have medical monitoring on your cow. Um, this is actually an interesting device. This is a scale, uh, which I'm a little scared of, um, which is <laughs> Wi-Fi connected. And so daily you, you take your weight and it actually gets reported back uh, to a website. So again, it's not something you directly talk to. Unfortunately, you are interacting with it somehow. Um, and it records your weight over a period of time. And this is also, uh, if, if you're runners, which I'm not, but my wife is a big one, there's these Nike Plus devices to put in your, in your shoe. And as you run, your iPhone or iPod you know, tracks how far you've run, and it can also upload that data to a website, like Daily Mile or on the Facebook or something, so your friends can see how far, how far you didn't run. <laughs> So again, what is a thing? Again, it's a very abstract concept. It's really whatever you want. It's something non-traditional that you want to connect and get the data off onto the internet. Uh, this is another statistic I saw yesterday, which is, you know, today we said there's roughly eight to 10 billion devices on the internet. In 2015, which is only a few years away, Cisco predicts there'll be 50 billion devices on the internet. And five years after that, close to 100 billion. Now there's, again, this is kind of a guess. There's other people that say it's going to be more in the 50 to 75 billion range. But again, that's a huge increase on devices that are on the internet. And over 90% of those aren't going to be your traditional computer or phone that you interact with. They're going to be things. So something non-traditional that's now connected to the internet that wasn't before, not something you're directly interacting with, kind of behind the scenes. So from a market business standpoint, just how big 
is there a market for these things? And it's, it's, it's pretty big. Um, it's actually kind of staggering. GE predicts that the Internet of Things can add 10 to 15 trillion dollars to the world economy in the next 20 years. Cisco predicts 14.4 trillion by 2020. And yeah, that's trillion with the T. It's a absolutely staggering number. So, you know, who's going to be competing for this Internet of Things market? Uh, pretty much everybody. It's a big number. There's going to be a lot of players in this, and it covers quite a, quite a bit more things than just little devices connected to the Internet. But, like I said, there's a huge opportunity for all sorts of different businesses, for efficiency improvements that can be gained by connecting things to the Internet. So there's a huge drive to connect a bunch of different things to the Internet, to deal with the data collection on the enterprise level, which is orders of magnitude greater than what you have today, just sorting all this data, dealing with that. So what about open source? Because again, this topic is, our discussion is really about open source and Internet of Things. You know, is there room for that? And yeah, there really is. So if we go back to, there's roughly 8 to 10 billion devices on the Internet today. You know, how does open source play a role in that? Uh, well, over 70% of the web server market today is based on open source. Apache is a big chunk of that. There's a new web server. I think it's up about 5-10% that's open source. Um, and out of smartphones, actually over 50% of smartphones shipping now are Android based or open source, which is pretty much Android based. IoT is a bit different. It's not something, it's not a PC that you interact with. It's not you know, a phone that has Android on it. It's typically a very deeply embedded device which you don't necessarily interact with. So how does open source play a role in that? You know, these devices, for a long time, if you've been involved in embedded development in any way, typically you're dealing with fairly large silicon vendors that have proprietary tools that um, you know, have these old, rather arcane software tools. Oops, sorry. Somebody's ringing. <laughs> sorry about that. So again, you have these tools that tend to be proprietary. Uh, you also have these very specific programmers, development systems, uh, in-circuit emulators, which are kind of old school. And then, in a lot of cases, if you're dealing with uh, a new chip or something, a lot of times the data you have to sign NDAs directly with the company with. It's not something that a normal person can get access to. But over the last 10, 15 years, that's drastically changed. I mean, my background is really embedded firmware and embedded hardware. And so I've seen a huge shift just over the last 10, 15 years that you know, professional developers are turning more and more to open source tools. Um, GCC in the embedded world, everybody knows a bit from Linux and desktop things, but increasingly almost imbe every embedded processor you can think of has some GCC variant uh, ported to it. Uh, all the way down from 8-bitters up to 32-bit processors. Many development suites are going the open source route. Uh, companies are adopting things like Eclipse uh, to build their development suites around, which is open source. And there's a number of free real-time operating systems that are coming out as well. Um, free Autos is a big one, Contiki, and numerous embedded Linuxes on, uh, for 32-bit platforms. Uh, whereas in the past, again, these would be very highly proprietary systems that cost a lot of money. You need a special development suite from a manufacturer uh, if you're doing embed embedded development work. Most of that, I wouldn't say most of that, a lot of that is going the open source route. And there's huge support even from these big silicon vendors supporting the open source tools. Um, not only from the tool chain, but then also open source source code. I mean, you see ARM, Intel, really all the big players, all the way down from the 8-bitters all the way up to the big 32, 64-bit processor vendors. And now there's this open source hardware movement, which is relatively new. It's really come onto the scene over the last five years. Um, it's a bit different than open source software, but uh, the idea is really that the design is, is free. All the design files are published. And so as an open source developer myself, 
the hardware designs I do, I actually release the schematics. You can download them today, edit them, not in a PDF format, but the actual raw data file formats. And also the print and circuit board layout files are published, available for general use. And the other side of that is, not only are you publishing the, the files, but people are generally allowed to reuse those based on the license you choose, and even develop similar devices based on those files for commercial applications. Um, there's really two big ones. There's, there's plenty more, but I'll just cover the, the two big guys that are out there that probably everybody's heard of. Raspberry Pi, which is a ARM-based device developed in England, originally targeted for $25 or $35 price points, extremely low cost. Um, again, geared for the education market to get kids interested, but I, I think the biggest interest lately has been in the kind of the hacker community that these things are selling crazy. Uh, but again, very low cost, open source hardware, also open source software on the device. Um, and you're seeing huge, I forget how many hundreds of thousands they have orders for, but it's just a huge market for this device. Which in reality is basically, I mean if you're from the old school of embedded systems, it's basically a development kit that you get from a processor vendor. And I don't think any processor vendor's ever sold a couple hundred thousand dollars of, or a couple hundred thousand units of a development kit. And then on the other side, and that's kind of the, the higher end type platform as HDMI out, Ethernet and things like that. On the other side is the Arduino, which is extremely popular among students. It's extremely popular um, among artists. And the idea is it makes electronics easy for a non-engineer to get into. Um, the Arduino platform is based, the main one is based on an 8-bit AVR. Um, it has a very nice open source software suite. So to do things like blinking lights or running motors and even connecting to the internet, you can do that through the use of an Arduino very simply using their software. Again, their software is all open source. They have a number of examples. And so as a non-engineer, non-software programmer, it's extremely easy to get involved in Arduino development. And so kind of where we come in is we've made the tiny Arduino, which is we kind of went the whole open source route where Arduino is open source. And we derived and did a different design. Um, which we call the Tiny Arduino, which essentially has the exact same functionality as an Arduino, but in a much smaller form factor. And I'll pass these around, you guys can take a look. And also the same expandability that an Arduino has, where if you look back at that Arduino, you can actually add expansion cards, which are known as shield 